The Centre Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics and Knightsbridge Overland. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique vehicles in their showroom located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. Thanks, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast number 123, 123 for June of 2023. I'm your host, John Cossage. Joining me, around the virtual campfires, Harold, Dixon, and Morgan. Welcome back, gentlemen. Good to see you guys. We were all at the Diamond Jubilee, and now we're back together on the podcast. Yes, it was nice to be out at the Jubilee, and <laughs> nice to be back here. The Jubilee was a fantastic experience. It'll be interesting to chat about. Yeah, I made it back from the Jubilee, and I'm here, and I think my arms are about an inch longer, but other than that, back to work. We have two guests this month. First, we'll talk with Nancy McKegg live from the Diamond Jubilee and from inside of his Discovery 3, Greg Fitzgerald announces exciting news about the reprinting of one of Barbara Toy's books. So stay tuned for that. Also coming up, we're going to talk about our Diamond Jubilee experience because all of us were there at the Diamond Jubilee. And unless you're brand new to the podcast, and if you are brand new to the podcast, welcome this is a long form podcast that comes out once a month. And we answer the question, is that all you talk about is Land Rovers? Yes, all we talk about is Land Rovers. Well, maybe 98% of the time, there's a bit of Jaguar and a little bit of Grenadier thrown in. And aside from saying it now, there is absolutely no mention of Mercury. I, get, I had, was trying to think of a brand we never talk about. Ready so. or otherwise. <laughs> this is the 75th anniversary of Land Rover and the 10th anniversary of this podcast. Thanks to all of our listeners for listening and engaging with us over that time. And a special thanks to our Patreon and Buy Me a Tea subscribers for their support. It does mean a lot to us, and we appreciate each and every one of you. We saw a number of you at the Diamond Jubilee, and it was nice to see everybody. And all of us were attended the 75th Diamond Jubilee, and we're going to talk about that after the news. But for now, a thank you to two of our Buy Me a Tea supporters. First, Justin Monin of Lucky 8 fame says, Thank you for all your hard work getting the 75th done and dusted. And actually, thank you to you, Justin. You did a great job at the Diamond Jubilee and nice booth and helps with the Diamond Jubilee. So thanks, Justin. And Bob Steele says the 75th Diamond Jubilee with the 1,000 plus enthusiasts on hand, including Steve Owen, his series One Journey, a money success, is due to our volunteer corps of tireless, skillful, and knowledgeable Land Rover enthusiasts. A big thank you to John, Harold, Dixon, and Morgan for making the event all the more special with your features in our live broadcast from the Greek people. It just doesn't get any better than this. And this is your monthly reminder. In fact, it's your final reminder. You have one month to get your Rover ready for the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in July of 2023. Just three weeks, really. And we need a good showing on July 23 and 22, and we need you to register. So if you're thinking of going, please register. There is a link in the show notes to the registration page. We need a good 25 Land Rovers to register within the first week of July to ensure that we have a good showing for the showcase, which gives us a tent to protect us from the sun. And you, if you register, you also get a t-shirt of the event and you also get a six pack of a very special beer. And probably more importantly, the coolest thing that you will create is a lap of the race course on Sunday morning. That's a unique activity that will be difficult to repeat. And I probably won't allow us to do it again after they see how much oil we're going to put on the track. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. And uh, also we how long we take doing our one lap around the track. That's true. They didn't set a time limit on it. Then that is a concern, especially considering how fast Land Rover's older ones especially can go. Or don't go as the case may be. <laughs> Grand Prix, this is going to be a one-time event and likely not to be repeated. You don't want to miss this one. Registration will get you said a lap of the course, a six-pack of the Center Steer English Ale, and a t-shirt. And you will also help support local charities here in the Pittsburgh area. So I've never done this before. We will probably never ask you this again, but pause the podcast right now 
visit centersteer.com, go to the show page for show number 123 and register right now. We'll wait. We'll be here when you get back. And hopefully you're back and you have registered. We appreciate it. We'll see you at the Vintage Grand Prix. After the news, our experiences at the Diamond Jubilee, but now it's time for the news. Jaguar Land Rover reveals new logo for JLR brand. I suspect that's the last time I'm going to say the words Jaguar Land Rover as part of the company. JLR All Out Reinvention gathers a pace as it reveals a new logo for its new official name, JLR. It's a simple motif in line with the minimalist styling ethos of the JLR's products and dealerships and is said to embody elegance, modernity, and the company's forward-thinking essence. It is the first time the company has ever officially had one logo rather than using the separate Jaguar and Land Rover brands. It will not appear on any cars, however, much like Stellantis, does not appear on any of the Vauxhall, Peugeot, or Citroen products. In unveiling the new logo, JLR reiterated that, quote, Land Rover brand will remain a key part of the company's DNA, unquote and the trademark oval badge will not disappear from its portfolio, contrary to earlier reports. <laughs> no, really, we didn't mean... So we have a new logo. In, in keeping with the spirit of the vehicles that it, the branding represents, the logo has already had parts fall off one of the letters. <laughs> the R. <laughs> yes, that's true. It does fall off Land Rover style where part of the R has fallen. What's holding it up? Is that, maybe it's an airbag, you think? Hopes and prayers. <laughs> yeah, JLR is now JLR, and it has its own logo. And there are pains to tell you that Land Rover name is not going away. Although, if you do visit Land Rover's website, whether it's the UK or the USA, you will notice that they have... Land Rover's is the URL. It's the web address. They didn't change that. You, once you visit the site, then you click on Range Rover, Discovery, or Defender. And then you go into the particular brand. If the company like JLR is going to consolidate their name down from full Jaguar Land Rover name to just the JLR initials, they might as well just turn it into a logo. It'll just be used on their corporate site. <laughs> I didn't check this before to think of it until we start recording the podcast, but I just punched in JLR.com. JLR.com looks like it is. Is available? I think no. Be. You got to go past the security warning. Oh, and, let's and go past security and see what happens. This is a view oh. the unsafe image. Yeah, they oh they didn't get a certificate for JLR.com, but JLR.com takes you to JaguarLandRover.com. Yeah, so good good on them. Yeah, good on surprise. There we go. Yeah, and using the the JLR new fancy logo in the header of the page. Honestly, that's going to fit a lot better on a mobile device, which is what you know, probably 60% of website viewers use at this point. Right, because the green oval was not noticeable and neither was the Jaguar name that they had that was specialized. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> they changed the, okay, changed the name, logos there, whatever, moving on. From, this, is, this article on CNBC has to do with the Jaguar Land Rover targets revenue of 28 billion pounds in fiscal year 24 and 30 billion in fiscal year 26. The paragraph or two that caught my attention in a presentation to the investors, the company said reimagination, reimagine, excuse me, will deliver and its investment target is three billion pounds per annum. Further, the company said that it is looking at free cash flow of two billion pounds by fiscal year 24 and continuing to be significantly positive thereafter. JLR aims to reduce the net debt to zero by fiscal year 2025. It's also interesting that they suggest that their annual revenue per unit, 70,000 pounds or $90,000 US. That's a healthy number. That is. And honestly, when it's nice to have a goal to get to net debt zero, but it's actually impressive that it's only a year and a half or two years away. With all the headwinds, quote unquote, that they talk about and having chip problems, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Good luck. <laughs> I certainly want the brand to continue, but I do seems seems to be a bit aggressive. Next up, JLR Land Rover Discovery has huge potential as its own brand. I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs, but. Really, that's as much detail as we're going to get. JLR bosses are confident that the Land Rover Discovery makes sense as a standalone brand as the company separates its lineup into four distinct pillars. 
Defender, Discovery, Jaguar, and Range Rover. Questions hang over the viability of carving out Discovery as a brand in its own right, given that it's currently the slowest selling Land Rover model, but bosses say that it can survive and thrive because of the unique role it plays in the JLR portfolio. Describing it as the Wii brand and calling it an enabler to make every day exceptional. Marketing boss Anthony Bradbury told Autocar, work is underway to determine how the Discovery family of the future will look. Quote, of the four brands, it's the one that in terms of the fu its future state, there's the most work to do on internally. But that's massively exciting because certainly in our view, it's got enormous potential to grow, unquote. JLR sold over 12,000 Discoveries in the 12 months to March, compared with nearly 75,000 of the Defender. But Bradbury said this was largely a result of the semiconductor shortage facing the company to prior to more profitable models. That says nothing. It's a lot of marketing speak. What yes, does the it, Discovery represent? The that's... Range Rover is obvious. It's luxury, high end. The Defender, okay. It's your rugged off-roader. We'll, we'll leave that where it is. But the, right, the original right. Discovery was your soccer moms. Is that the market segment for this thing? Right now, the Discovery represents the huge opportunity to figure out what the Discovery is going to represent. Yes, let us yes. discover what the Discovery is. We'll discover. Let us discover what the mm. Discovery will discover. As I said, that headline pretty much said it all. Land Rover Discovery has huge potential as its own brand. And they're going to investigate what that potential is going to be. They're just backpedaling the fact that it doesn't sell and that they really ought to kill it, but they don't want to. Yeah, I agree. I also think that they're in a better position with the Discovery than they are with the whole of Jaguar at this point. Yeah. It, yeah. It could be a worse situation. Hit on something, though, Morgan. Maybe that the Discovery becomes the first full electric or all electric part of the Land Rover brand like Jaguar is doing. That's where you do all your full electric testing. You don't have any internal combustion. That might be a good way to, to move that particular model. I think that would be smart. Obviously, they haven't said anything about it because they're still trying to figure out. And they're still trying to what discover discovery what the discovery is. will discover. <laughs> yes. And they have announced plans for Range Rover to have the first fully electric models. But my guess is that part of that is because right now, all of the really the only selling, but also the best selling fully electric vehicles are the highest luxury brands because they're expensive. You could figure out a cheap electric platform. The disco would be a great place to use it. Absolutely. Can they make them just run on the few remaining existing cable car lines? There you, know, you go. Or it could be your uh, hydrogen test bed, an electric test bed. It could be the alternative fuel test bed instead of it being any ice one. But yeah, they're already moving down that path. But then again, there JLR is already behind on on all electric because they have, with all the chip difficulty, they had enough problems getting out the orders that they had of the models they had, let alone invest in future drivetrains and future fuel capability. It's there, yeah. They're, Hopefully they get to this net zero business, but they're in a challenging position at the moment. Yeah. And they were that far behind in the chip shortage because they're such a small company, so they couldn't get priority. They're even further behind in terms of batteries, sourcing batteries. And the pandemic put them back even further, pushing towards a million cars a year, which was small compared to everybody else. They only make 300,000 vehicles in a year, so they got pushed back even further. Let's face it, for 75 years, they've never been on the cutting edge of any technology. They've used existing technologies where they could afford them and get them. So that's why they're behind on, on this cutting edge stuff. All right, moving on. This Land Rover dealer charges $500 per hour for service. So I, was, you know, I thought this was worth bringing up because I recall taking when I had a Discovery and my Freelander taking it to the dealer and it was something like 100, 100 an hour, 95 an hour. So Land Rover Brooklyn, this is in New York, service department has taken things to the eye-popping extreme by charging owners $500 per hour for labor and nearly $500 for a standard oil change. Asking for a quote for an oil change, this with the drive.com, for an oil change for a 2013 LR4, they gave me a price of $452.27 before tax, which included a half hour of labor plus parts. Now, an LR4 oil change kit from FCP Euro, which includes eight quarts of synthetic oil, fresh filter, 
and a drain plug cost $134. So they're really upcharging on the $500 per hour. And where is this dealership located? Brooklyn, New York. Not even Manhattan, the high rent district. Brooklyn is still still pretty pricey. Compared to Manhattan, it's cheap, but compared to the real world, it's, yeah, it's pricey. Yeah. It's, it's interesting in the article saying that the cost of the per hour costs in the New York City area, are, they're not low. There's, as they point out, Porsche South Shore and Long Island's 225 an hour. Porsche Manhattan's at 350, shows Manhattan premium. But, and then elsewhere, it's between 100 and $300 per hour, but 500 is certainly eye-opening. 500 bucks an hour. I want that service to include a happy ending. Next up, we have a couple recalls here in the U.S. that I thought it was worth mentioning. First up, Land Rover Discovery. This looks like the current, what are we on? Disco 5, right? A Disco 5 recalled for doors that can open while driving. <laughs> Uh, uh, di the Disco is the new series truck, after all. <laughs> yeah, they, they downgrade those to the Series yeah. 3 latches. And there's also the good point that, A, they're not suicide doors. And looking at Discovery sales figures, there's not going to be many that actually have to come back. <laughs> Wait, that's not necessarily true. Land Rover's were calling nearly 30,000 Discoveries from 2017 to 2020 model years because of the rear doors may open while driving. The problem has to do with water leaking into the part of the door latch mechanism, which can lead to a failure over time. If the latch doesn't work, the door might appear to be properly closed. Even if it isn't, there won't be any warning on the dashboard that a door isn't properly latched either because the light will go out even though it's not properly latched. So 30,000 Disco 5s, that's pretty much every Disco 5 they sold in this country. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes. That's the fix yes. is disabling the keyless entry function, which is supposed to be a feature. Carry a bungee cord like you do with a series truck. See, the Disco is the new series. Just Thank be glad you. it only comes open, doesn't fall off. Yeah, and they can't swing a full 180 degrees to whack the front doors of your Disco either. But wait, there's more. NHTSA has a recall number that encapsulates a problem with the 2022 and 2023 Range Rover. The taillights are prone to fail either partially or 100% as a result of damage to the wiring caused by foam blocks located adjacent to the taillights. Care to guess what is Land Rover's remedy for this problem? Not surprising anyone, dealers nationwide will be instructed to remove the foam blocks in question. An estimated uh, nearly 13,000 vehicles are called back with production dates ranging between July 21 of 2021 and November 29th of 2022. This relatively random cutoff date may indicate a change in production that JLR didn't make public. Dealers will be informed of recall number 23V394 on June 15th, while customers will be notified by first class mail around July 28th. So the taillights may fail. That pretty much describes every Defender I've ever worked on, every series truck I've ever worked on. Taillight warranty is only as good as far as I can see said taillights when you leave. Next up, another Land Rover Defender copycat emerges from China. Chinese automakers are notorious for allegedly copying the design of vehicles from other brands. It's not really much of a concern as the U.S. market doesn't offer them anyway. But if you're, in, if you're interested to see the latest that China's come up with, meet the Stone Zero One. In a report by Car News China, the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology revealed details about the Stone Zero One. The SUV was created by Rocks Motor and named the model Lu K. But due to financial woes, the automaker co collaborated with BAIC, and it is now called Stone. And right off the bat, the Stone 01 is unmistakably a copycat of the Land Rover Defender, especially from this side. <laughs> yeah. I wonder uh, if you could put that front clip on a Defender. The and headlights be, are different. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Put that front clip on just to create a different look to a Defender. Get rid of those angry bird headlights that they put on the Defender. Do this. The Stone 01 isn't the only Chinese copycat of the Defender. Earlier this year, Yang Wang launched the U8 which looks like a way beefier version of the British off-roader. It also has more power, producing a whopping 1,100 horsepower from a quad motor setup. There's no picture available on that one. I like um, the tail better, too. There's only one set of taillights. 
Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have the little squirgles. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't oh. have that stupid square on the side either. And it looks like the tailgate, I, do you think the tailgate opens to the side or does it open up or is it a split tailgate? It's kind of tough to tell. It opens to the side. You think it opens to the side? I'm really yeah. thinking it'd be fun to... Next, do Land Rover Defender 130 owners need to be reminded why they pick their cars? A weird title, but the thing to mention here is a J.D. Powers 2022 Automotive Performance Execution Layout or Appeal Study surveys real-world owners on their likes and dislikes for their cars they have put in their garage, and the results of the Defender 130 are a mixed bag of anticipated answers and some surprising findings. Respondents are asked to rank Land Rover's agreeability in 10 categories. Driving comfort and driving feel, exterior styling, feeling of safety, fuel economy, getting in and out, infotainment, interior design, powertrain, setting up, and starting. According to the survey, what the Land Rover Defender 130 owners like most about their midsize SUV is its looks. Its exterior styling topped the list. The 130's butch appearance and commanding presence certainly garnered attention, and it doesn't look like a typical model in its class. Obviously, among buyers surveyed, this is the strongest suit. And perhaps as expected, the 130's fuel economy ranks lowest on the list. Both 130 models are rated by the EPA for just 19 combined miles per gallon. I don't think that's particularly unexpected. That's actually pretty good for what it is. Yeah. It's definitely more than the Discovery like 2 I had. Oh, God, yeah. And I wonder how some of the other comparison or similar vehicles, I think even the Suburban is still bigger than the 130, but it's got to be close in terms of the size. I think those are running 17 or 18. Gotcha. Yeah, the Wagoneers rated for just 15 combined, but it only has 10 inches of ground clearance. Next, this is about the EverReady showcases redefined and electrified Land Rover Series 2A at the London Concours. This is the EverReady or EverRoddy, I'm not sure how you say that, automotive technology company. They are specializing in redefining and future-proofing automotive icons through cutting edge EV powertrains. They have a 60 kilowatt hour battery and a 150 brake horsepower, 300 Newton meter from his electric motors. The Series 2A offers both two wheel and four wheel drive modes and a range of up to 150 miles, almost identical to the combustion engine, combined with a regenerative braking, AC and DC fast charging capability, combined with the very latest in sustainable electric materials. Yes, this seems to be the further highlights of variety's overall mission for sustainable luxury. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh when I think of 2A and luxury. But we'll talk more about an electric series that I saw and was able to drive at the Diamond Jubilee later, but it was worth mentioning Everati uh, showcased this. The I think the company that Widom Engineering used, used is a different company, not Everati, but it's still in the same, they're all in the same wheelhouse. I think we're going to see more and more of these conversion kits and so on coming out. Yeah. Which will be interesting to watch. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And truthfully, the series vehicles are ideal for that kind of conversion because they have so much space available and it's very square space. Which and they're easy to take easy apart to and change in. things out. Right. Exactly. It's pretty straightforward to restore them. We'll move on to the 2024 Disco Sport and the 2024 Range Rover Evoke are both getting refreshed. And you look at both of these articles, they're really pretty much the same car. And the big change in both of them is they are getting a new interior with a 11.4 inch screen that's curved and they've eliminated all physical buttons. Which is uh, that's fascinating because I've read a number of articles that basically say the consumers don't like these touch screens. They want buttons and knobs and so on to come back and other automakers are actually going back the other way now yeah we talked about that last month there was that article that said yeah customers are yeah, yeah. they want some buttons while you're driving they don't want to have to hunt and peck and not sure if they're touching the right button if they're traveling at 80 miles an hour down the interstate we'll see how this yeah, plays we'll, yeah we'll, we'll see it's another area where land rover is a little behind the times but it also feels like they finally got touchscreen infotainment system that is somewhat functional. I'm not going to say it's perfect, <laughs> certainly compared to everybody else, but compared to their prior one that actually works systems. 
Yeah. So, oh, we finally did it. Let's hold on to this. <laughs> and the one thing I noticed here is it comes with compatibility with Amazon Alexa. So you don't have to fumble for the non buttons. You can just have Alexa do it for you. Yeah. How well is that going to work? About though, as well as Alexa does anything. And I know we've said that Land Rover did nothing for the 75th anniversary of Land Rover, except for coming out with the Lego Defender 90 heritage version, which by the way, I'm in the middle of building, but I'm wrong. Nice. Turns out I was wrong. They actually have come out with a limited edition 2023 Land Rover Defender 75th limited edition model. And this is special occasion for the 75th anniversary. It's distinctive given that Land Rover's traditional grasmere green paintwork is the only color on offer. The same U as the 2015 Defender limited edition model they had in 2015 and also the original grasmere green is the original Land Rover color. With the new colors also available in 20 inch wheels finished in the same color. And there are some small 75 year badges on the side hinge tailgate and the ends of the dashboard. So they have come out with a special, they have come out with something to celebrate Land Rover 75 years in this. However, there's good news and bad news. The good news is they have a limited edition Defender 75th anniversary edition. The bad news is not available in North America. I admittedly, I didn't look at Land Rover Canada, but I looked at Land Rover US, Land Rover Australia, and Land Rover UK, and the models available in Australia. And I can't America. imagine there's any content that wouldn't be certifiable in this country, but it's just yeah, bad. it's just badges. We don't need no stinking badges. Just reeks of like them discovering an opportunity for yet another special edition. And I'm starting to think that the most exclusive new Defender you can buy is one that is not some sort of special edition. I do like the Grasmere Green, and I think it looks really good oh, yeah. in Grasmere Green. It's a nice but, color, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it, it really is. I didn't see a price. I was Oh, in the UK, it's 85,000 pounds. 85,000 pounds. Oh, so in 25 years, you can bring that to the US. If it still runs. Yes. 15 years. 15 years in, the, in Canada. Canada. Yep. Next up, here's how to enter Land Rover Defender Service Awards. So Land Rover here in the U.S. and North America, excuse me, include our Canadian friends, is doing the Defender Service Awards again. And the Defender Service Awards uh, are a beloved initiative that Land Rover are proud to bring back for a third year, celebrating the organizations that make a difference in the communities. It speaks to the core of the Defender brand that is the most powerful when it's on a mission to help others says Joe Everhart, president and CEO of Jaguar Land Rover North America. There are six Defender Service Award categories in 2023, Veterans and Civil Servant Outreach, Community Service Award, Search, Rescue, and Emergency Support Services, Outdoor Accessibility and Education Award, Animal, Wildlife, and Marine Mammal Welfare. Wow, that's a tough one to say. I'm going to try that again. Animal, Wildlife, and Marine Mammal Welfare. And finally, the Defender Service Honorees 2021 and 22 finalists. So to enter, organizations can be nominated or self-nominated by filling out an entry form on Land Rover's website and submitting a video of up to three minutes in length that details the organization's mission, how it fills a need in the community, and how a Defender 130 would further their efforts. Submissions are open from June 15th to July 21st of 2023. Winners all will be announced in the autumn. And we had a winner up in Canada this year, Ottawa Valley Search and Rescue, correct? That's right. They were down in Greek Peak. It was, nice was with bilingual emergency markings on it. Next is a vintage Shoreland Mark III armored patrol car with a rotating roof turret. The Shoreland Mark III armored patrol car was developed by Short Brothers and Harlan Limited of Belfast, Northern Ireland. It became a regular sight on the streets of Northern Ireland during the Troubles, particularly throughout the 70s and into the 80s. The vehicle started out as a 109 Series 3. However, it's been significantly modified. The original thin aluminum body is gone, replaced by welded 8.2 inch millimeter, third of an inch steel armor plating. There's some other changes there. If you want to check out the article online, it was available on Bring a Trailer. And there's a little more to explain about it. The vehicle here is a Shoreland Mark III. It's one of the examples made before the rooftop machine gun turret was discontinued, making it quite desirable in the military vehicle collector circles. 
The rotating turret remains fully operational, those you might expect. The machine gun has been deactivated. It's finished in black with black steel wheels, black mm -hmm. interior. It rides on period correct tires, though they do show signs of age and cracking. Power is provided by 2.6 liter Land Rover Straight 6 and retains its original headlight guards, forward spotlight, rear hatch siren, the Klansman intercom system with two helmets, and its Cobra CB radio. Recent servicing has included overhauling the brakes, replacing the transmission, clutch, and carburetor. It is being offered with manufacturer's literature, shop manuals, memorabilia, and a clean Virginia title in the seller's name. And I believe, what, we looked it up, didn't it sell? 19000 approximately. See, now this would be awesome for parades and stuff because you could retrofit that turret with T-shirt cannons. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That would have been good at Greet Peak. We could have fired off some memorabilia as we go through Fender Village. Yeah, it didn't make it. It should have made it through Greet Peak, but it didn't. Next, Jay Leno drives a military spec 1972 Series 3, and he loves its open top qualities. There's a full video. It's about 30 minutes long from Jay Leno's garage. We'll have a link, of course, to that in the show notes. The vehicle in question, it's a 109 Series 3, looks a lot like my 109 Series 3. In fact, they're both FFRs fitted for radio. Alex Grappo from Drive Coffee owns it. He's in Colorado, and Jay drives it. Jay's not a, not a Land Rover person necessarily, but he does appreciate the vehicle for what it is. He understands where it came from, what it's doing, and its qualities. Want to see how one rides and what it can do? He doesn't take it off-road. He goes through some puddles, but... It's worth checking out. It's one of the smoothest rides I've ever seen in Series 3. <laughs> the camera does a good job of not shaking and bouncing. Probably a really expensive steady cam. Yes, no doubt. No doubt. Good looking truck. And they've, you know, it's good mm. patina. It looks very familiar. And they've done a, a little bit of work to keep it running. But it, he, well, they talk about how they've taken it to Moab. They all need a little work to keep them running. That's true. <laughs> and I heard some comments where they got some things wrong. They got some things wrong, but they eventually get there. The essence of it and the generalness of Land Rover ownership in Series 3, they may not cross all the T's and dotted the I's and the rivet counters will go, no, it really was this. But they get the general of, of the Series 3 and the 109 that it is. So, yeah, check it out. Go out to Jay Leno's garage. It's a half hour if you want to. Really, it fulfills your Rover porn. If you need more Rover porn, you're having withdrawal from the Diamond Jubilee. Here's this might help. So fulfill some of that to need. I like the quote here where it says, it's fun to drive. You can't get anything this open anymore. I think the power is adequate. It's like you say, it's not fast, but it's not slow. You're just using all the pedal travel all the time. I like that. that. Good. They do mention how it really doesn't go fast. And I think Alex, the owner said, yeah, one time I got up to 70 miles an hour and that's when I started to back off because you don't feel too comfortable. And little concerned. I'm like, yes, been there. 70 seems a bit excessive. I think that's one of the things that people don't understand about a series vehicle is that they don't go fast, but when you get them to their top speed, it is too fast. And that's the news for June of 2023. We're live at an Arcs Diamond Jubilee. I'm sitting on the couch in the podcast chamber i don't know which what this is with nancy mckaig nancy welcome thank you so much this is a palace i'm sitting on a nice comfy cushion <laughs> this interview could last all day absolutely it, it might this is very nice here nancy how many events land rover events have you been to do you know oh my goodness i don't know that i can even count them but i've been doing this since 1994 i believe is when we had our first mar and that came about because my husband and Sandy Grice and myself were having a small event at our newly purchased farm in Penland, Virginia. And we even rented a porta potty, one, and it rained and nobody came. And we went, mm. so Monday, I got on the phone and I said, look, if we're going to do this, let's think big. So I contacted Land Rover North America. Alistair Bell was a family acquaintance from our local vet. So he was in the publicity department for Land Rover North America, and he gave us access to all of their goodies and all of their support. They actually gave us monetary support in the first. And 
that first Mar, we had 88 vehicles come, set up at our farm in our big field, and uh, the excitement for figuring out the caterers and what to do and the trail systems was just amazing. So that's really how Mar got started. And Was it always called Mar? The Munich? internet was very young. You had groups, the D.C. Metro folks, and they started calling it MAR because we were Mid-Atlantic Rally, and everybody's going to come up with anachronism. But uh, that and Rove, just synonymous with a, an annual event that uh, was really going to be one of the best in the country. And that just made us so proud. And the back sell from all these people that said, we had the best time. Yeah. And they were so nice. And in the early days, that first Mar, I remember my daughter, Sarah, was about seven. And that evening after dinner, she and I walked all the way around our field and we were able to talk and thank each person for coming. It was the best time. It was so wonderful. And to be able to duplicate that for many years to come in different ways, it evolved and it grew. After four or five or six years, it was just too big for, we were using all of our fields and we went, we're too big, we have to move. That's when we went to Pearl's Pond, stayed there and moved around a little bit to Wheatlands. To, we had one, one event up near Doswell, Virginia. I was and, at that event. Uh-huh. That wasn't one of my favorites. Hey, you learn from your yep. mistakes. And not so much mistakes, but just how you could do things better. That was the very first time there was a shower truck. No, oh, yes. And that was a revolution. That was deluxe, and wasn't it? Was it was deluxe. And people, I, we still talk about that. Isn't that great? And there's one here, actually. That's one I know. We, why there's one here. That's why we States. suggested it. It's yeah, like, it worked out well. I've just had fun being a part of the evolution of Mar. And watching this event at Anarch here has come kind of full circle. Right. I've always considered myself somewhat of a writer. I'm good with the words. Don't get me with the numbers. But I've just referred to myself over the years and written under the auspices of a dutiful Land Rover wife. And that's really what I am because this is pretty all-encompassing. And there are a lot of women getting involved, and I'm so happy to see that. Yes. But a lot, most of the majority here would not be here without the support of their partner and their spouse and their family. And to see it grow and see these little kids just grow up like ours did in the back of a Land Rover. My son's sleeping and we're on a trail and his head is rocking and he's drooling and sound asleep. It's perfect. So you married into Land Rovers or were you a Land Rover person before? I was not. I worked at a barn in Goochland County, vacated my retail position in downtown Richmond and I said, I'm going to go work with horses. I can't afford to buy them, so I'm going to work with them and get somebody to pay me to do it. And I did for about 30 years. But at my first job, my first barn, this guy drove up in a white zebra stripe scout. And he caught my eye and he got out and I went, ooh, he's cute. And his fiance at the time waved a ring at me and said, hands off, honey, he's mine. They got married anyway. It was very short lived. About six months later, Mike and I still <laughs> ended up together. And we've been married now for ooh, 40 years. And it really, the Land Rovers over our lifetime of being married ha has been such a wonderful foundation for us. Keeps him out of the bars. Not that Michael is a drinker. There's no drinking that takes place at any Rover. Oh, no, no. No, please, let's not but let anybody he, that happen. Exactly. It's just not the focus for us. We'll have a little ceremonial sip. But it, it is. It's all about the ceremony and the pomp and circumstance. I know we're ready for that this coming Friday. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's tonight, isn't it? I better go get dressed now. No. Is there a specific model you like? Is there? You... I love classic Range Rovers. Love classic Range Rovers. Do you drive at all, or are you? Oh, I've drove for years. I've done the RTV course in yeah. in this truck and stuff, just with neighbors. Yeah. And uh, really, How long have you been driving. Probably about forty years, because yeah. I started driving when I met Mike. Nice. And uh... did you drive stick before that? Absolutely. Yeah. My first love was old trucks. Oh yeah. And. Michael, after we had taught him, he just, I said, I need a man to do my head job. So he came on my old 55 Dodge pickup truck and helped me. And I went, ah, this is the man for me. And we have just, we've had so much fun in our life. We've, everybody's had trials, yeah. but yeah, yeah. 
the Land Rovers have provided a community of friendship and fellowship that you can't get in normal social circles. We don't find that going to a bar every weekend or something, so this is his. When I know he's out in his shop and he's tinkering, he's got a little bluegrass on, mm. that man is happy. Sometimes he throws tools, but that's okay. <laughs> I, that, that just helps. That that's helps. okay. Do you have your own? Do you have your own truck? I had a little mini stroke a couple of months ago, so Sorry. I pulled my stroke card and I said, "We need a newer Land Rover model with a little more comfort for me." So we, um, new to us, went and researched a L322, and it's a supercharged and it's yeah. got the tow package, and that's what Michael wanted was something that we could go overland with after this event, and I think we're gonna do it. Oh, nice. Yeah, Good. so I'm very excited, but I really haven't driven that one much. Right. He was in the front, there was some rattle or something, and uh, he was in the front checking out an antifreeze leak is what it was, and I wanted to put my window down, and I reached over and pressed the right buttons. The car started jumping up and down, and the suspension is, I didn't know what I was doing. It was like a low rider in Miami. <laughs> that thing was a hopping. Mike's going, oh, oh, whatever you're pushing. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> but anyway, I do love that truck. And we call it McKegg's Folly. And I'll go out and pet it every now and then when I see it. So it's wonderful. He's had to do a lot of work on it. Some major maintenance, replacing parts and pieces. But uh, it's he's really gone through the truck with a fine tooth comb and uh, it's just ready to roll so we love it and here at the diamond jubilee how have you been involved in organizing and keeping the, the, the event happening well, I, I know you've been involved so well i'm involved really from the from the background and i'm a sounding board when mike gets off a four-hour zoom meeting that's and a, he's that's, frustrated that's a short call yeah. yeah and he'll tell me the next morning particularly We'll go over what was discussed and what frustrates him or whatever. I'm really Lady Faldera because I want to insert the little fun things here or there. And these guys are seeing the big motorized picture, but I want the little stuff. I want the good food here and there and placed here. I want the shower trailers. It's about the comfort. And the men are going, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll make the suggestions and then slowly but surely they get passed down the chain of command. We get our way just I, in the back door. Hey, you, you work your angles. There you go. You got to work the angles. It's all about the partnership. as you said, There you, as you go. Said it earlier. It's all about partnership. There yeah. you go. I thank you very much for coming on the podcast and in this, our live setting here in the podcast palace, I think you called it. Yeah. Very well, thank you, John. And I appreciate you valuing the female perspective. And uh, I just enjoyed joining you today. Thank you so much. And best of luck with your continued podcast here because you've got a lot of good people to talk to. I do. Great. Thank you, sir. Best wishes to you. Thanks, John. It's 2023, and we've been talking for at least over a year about 2023 being the Land Rover's 75th anniversary. And the four of us were all attended Anarch's Diamond Jubilee, June 14th through the 18th of 2023, just to mark the date for any archival purposes in the future. And I think we're all still coming down from the high that was the Diamond Jubilee. It's only a few weeks since then. I know, I had a great time. I'll be candid. I think it went better than expected. <laughs> Getting all those people together and all the trucks the activities we had planned and all the things in play and emotion and trying to get everybody together at one place at one time, you know, having Dixon and I in particular being on the planning committee, knowing what all went into it, it just turned out great. And I remember saying this, I think to each of you at one point, just looking around, take it all in. I really don't see this number of trucks, this quality of trucks, this quantity of trucks, type of Land Rovers will ever be assembled I think ever again, the things that we saw there will, I, I don't know that you'll ever get them all in one place at the same time, not even in this continent and maybe not anywhere in the world, maybe at Gaydon, but they're all, they're in a museum. The vehicles we saw were vehicles that people drove or trailered, or they drove them around even on the trails or in the vendor village. It was, a, I think, a unique and special event. If you missed it, I'm so sorry. You missed a great event that I think Admittedly, I'm biased. I was on the planning team. I think we, we did a great job and knocked it out of the park. I've heard nothing but accolades about the Jubilee. 
Anybody have any first initial impressions or top line impressions? In the 10 years we've been doing, this is the first time we've had the entire podcast crew in one place. And just in general, the timing of it, having just come out of the pandemic and hitting the 75th anniversary, we were all pretty starved for a really big Land Rover event and we got one. So yeah, that was really nice. And the weather and delivered. It was a little wet for the Wednesday and into the Thursday, but then it was just beautiful for the rest of it. It was classic British weather, though. Combination of rain, then nice, then rain, then nice. I think for archival purposes down the road, for anybody listening to this podcast, and maybe if you're someone who is helping to organize Land Rover's 100th anniversary, <laughs> and you're listening to this, the... God help you. you. <laughs> the events w ran from a Wednesday to a Sunday, and I drove up on Tuesday, and the weather was absolutely perfect. It was sunny, it was warm, but it was not humid. My 110 just, I, it went, I swear it was right, correctly balanced with how much was in the vehicle, and it cruised at 70 a couple of times. I, mean, I looked down, I'm doing 70 miles an hour, and I feel comfortable. I didn't feel there's no rattle. There was no like pulling to a side. It was fantastic. And probably cruised at 65 most of the time. And then Wednesday, when the event started, it rained all day, I think for, except for an hour at some point. And I ended up being in the registration area. And then Thursday, it dried out. It was warm and sunny all Thursday. Friday, as Harold said, it was on and off rain, but it was generally wet that day. And that's what we also, we had our Jubilee dinner. And then on Saturday, it got dry again. And then Sunday was another fantastic day to return home. It was warm, a little more humid, it was warm. And that was kind of like the weather, as Harold said, it felt very British. From all the people I talked to who were out on the trails, it sounded like it made them quite interesting because it's typical sort of, I don't know if it's technically the Adirondacks, there, uh, but typical sort of a little bit of soil on top of bedrock clay. and yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's, no it's, clay. It, it was just packed gravel with a, a tad of right. weeds growing on top. Yeah, and it's been so dry so far this year that once it was rock hard, an inch or two down, but on the top with all that fresh rain, it was just quite slippery. And not everybody is used to tight trails like we have in doing, but it was quite challenging. Technically, I think it's Appalachian Plateau there, not Adirondacks. So there were 30 miles of trails. I'm, I'd be curious to see if anyone actually managed to do all of them, but it was a fantastically well-organized event. The different people responsible in the different areas, Dave on registration, Scott on the rally control, be so sure. People said that about the 50th. That was a 300 plus truck event. The 75th was 500 plus trucks. It probably suffered a bit because some of the negativity ahead of it was the dust bowl that the 50th was, but this year it was just turned out fantastically. And for the listeners that actually participated in the rally, the board of directors of Anarch has sent out a survey and we would really like people to go and fill it out to give us your opinion on what worked what didn't work and a leading question when would you like to see another one of these things again yes there's people that would are suggesting next year i think many of the volunteers and so on <laughs> just laugh at you at that idea not happening at least not from this volunteer but will it be 25 for the hundredth or might it be something sooner this is the importance of get people filling out that survey and telling us what you thought, what worked and what didn't work. There are a few things that I know I missed when on the Friday, when just as a random event, when we parked a couple of 80 inches together and we ended up having 12 of them there for a photo session, which just drew in the people. At which point I realized we should have done this with all of the different Land Rovers. And the next day, the Defender people got the 90s and 110s out. And then there was another session with the new Defenders and such out there to give everyone an opportunity to go and see these things. That was a big miss on our part, I think, was not having a group photo of all the trucks that could be available to a photo. I think that was definitely something that we could have done better. 
as I like mm -hmm. to say during the event, that was the only mistake we made. <laughs> that, that, that probably is the only oversight there was. Everything else just turned out very well. Though one thing I'd have to ask you, John, about was when we had that team competition of team underpowered hour versus team center steer when you sold me to the other side and I had to compete with Ike <laughs> against Morgan and Harold. And I have to ask you, but you get your thing sold off. We needed dude, to bring balance. Dude, your team won. What are you complaining about? <laughs> I know. That was team series one versus team Freelander. Was it a doubt? Oh, How many Freelanders were there at? Repeat. There were zero. In round those numbers. One, well, round yeah. numbers, the zero. The round number, zero, a yeah. circle. One, one was registered, but it did not attend. It, it did, did not, not so. make it. It tried. Yeah. It couldn't make it. So the owner did come, though I think it was in the defender. We'll do a little round table now, and I want to ask each of you what your highlight of the Diamond Jubilee, and we'll start with Dixon since you, you were on team under power hour. It's actually a very difficult question to answer here. If anything, there was just so much to do. I wish I'd gotten out more on the trails. I wish I'd gone and seen more of the these classic Land Rovers that were on display. Herb Zipkin's expedition vehicle to the Firefly, to the the Canadian Spec 101 and, thing, and things like that. There was just so much to do. To me, I guess the highlight was going and meeting people that some of whom I had not seen since the 50th anniversary Back in 1998, that was, I guess that would be the highlight for me, but it was the, the, all the people there and meeting all the people was probably the best thing. And not having the event long enough to participate in everything. M Morgan, do you have a personal highlight of the Jubilee you'd like to share? Yeah, absolutely. It really, honestly, it's hard to get past Dixon's answer because for me, I've been doing a bunch of the Vermont Overland events and stuff over the years, but those have, those are no longer happening at this point. So it really was just the opportunity to get out and see all of the Land Rover folks that I've met over the years, see their vehicles, some of the unique vehicles that I have not seen because I'm fortunate enough in Vermont at the British Invasion in Stowe to see a lot of the unique Land Rovers in New England. And of course, we visited Jim Macri and seen all of his impeccable restorations, including the center steer. So seeing some of the other ones that I don't get to see as frequently, but again, all the people, the new people, all the people that I've seen over the years from all over, just coming back to one place with all their vehicles. I similarly w wish I had gotten out on the trails, but there was just so much to do that it wasn't like I was disappointed that I didn't go on the trails because I was still happy with all the decisions I made and all the things I did. It was just great to see everybody who could possibly make it in the same place at once with all their vehicles. So Harold, are you going to hold to the answer that it was, there was too much going on? I don't necessarily agree that there was too much going on. There was a lot going on. I wish I'd had more time. And perhaps if I had it to do over again, I would take some time and try to plan my time to make better use of the things that were there because there was so much. But I think for me, if you're looking for highlights, this was the first time I'd seen the center steer prototype. So I really enjoyed that. And the rest of Jim Macri's fleet, which was all phenomenal stuff. And, and yeah, a lot of special rovers there and meeting lots of people, including people we've had on the show here before. That was fun. Bumping into guests that we've talked to. It was, it was not getting pulled by your dog. <laughs> That's not something I would like want to make an event out of, but <laughs> yeah, it seems like my dog wanted to make that the focus of the event. That's for sure. Yeah, that's it was a, it was certainly an interesting challenge trying to have a conversation with somebody when mid sentence I'd suddenly be ten feet away. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are right. There, there's it's tough to pick out one highlight of the event, and we'll talk about more things. But if the thing that I keep coming back to. I think the Diamond Jubilee, and it's tough. It really is because there's so much that was happening, in, including the organizational part of it. I guess the thing that keeps coming back to me is going over to Whittem Engineering 
and visiting their booth, their pavilion, their tent that had the all electric converted series truck, and then being able to drive it. And that was just, I know it's very exciting. And that, and this includes me sitting in the center steer and Mr. Macri said, please take off your shoes. And I did. This includes getting a ride in the Pink Panther, getting a ride in the Pink Panther. I'm going to repeat that a third time, getting a ride in the Pink Panther, meeting uh, Nick Dimbleby and Nick Rogers and Kim McCullough. All these things happened and seeing Bill Burke again, but riding in that series three was just was very exciting. And the, it was silent until you got underway. and because it's mated to the existing transfer case, you get to hear that whine. <laughs> so you're thinking, oh, it's an all-electric vehicle. It's going to be silent. No. But in <laughs> fact, I think they left the transmission in that one, too. So there's yeah. still things that you could be breaking, John, and lots Trying of not noise. To. Lots of noise. A regenerative braking is amazing. And they had a, this is a prototype. Braking of any sort in a series <laughs> truck is amazing. That's true. This is a prototype. They had a switch that you could choose no regenerative braking, I think like 15%. And then I want to say maybe 80%. I can't remember the number he told me, but you take your foot off the accelerator and then the regenerative braking is on, man. That thing just, it slows down very quickly and you can almost on a flat ground, it would come to a stop. It would, just like it would you're in mud or something, huh? Just absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You it was, can really do one pedal driving with that kind of setting. Yes. And it did have the clutch, but it was really an on off switch. There was no feathering. The computer handled that part. It didn't dump all of the horsepower to right to the drivetrain. It knew to ramp that up and it really ran in third gear kind of the whole time. And occasionally went, to, I did try fourth because he said, yeah, try fourth, but it was literally an off switch. You push the clutch, put in gear, leave off in the clutch and it handles the, any feathering that's necessary. So you don't break the transmission, but that would have to be I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's tough. It's tough. They also, maybe it's because the Whittem also had an electric kettle and they had Yorkshire gold tea and the weather was perfect for tea. And I went over there often and they were happy to make me tea. So <laughs> maybe a point well, of personal we, privilege. I got to sit in on their presentation too. And it was quite fascinating. As we discussed earlier in the news, they're re doing some of the conversions in a way where it's really a bolt in zero modification to the existing structure and mounting points and stuff, which is really impressive. It's a great way to do it. Is reversible changes are important when you're talking about something that has like collector value. And I think they're going with electrogenic, which is different than the Everati people. But I think the electrogenic people, we talked about either last podcast or maybe two podcasts ago that the British army is taking four defenders. And I think they're using electrogenic as their prototype company yeah. to build those electric defenders. That was actually part of Widom's presentation in the tent. Oh, they good. Sh they okay. showed pictures of yes. that. Okay. Yep. But then it was the right people. But to bring it back, I think that we had them on the podcast before Bob Steele and, and Bruce Fowler did a fantastic job hurting the cats and making this event come off. Exactly. And I think there'll be a lot of people that were thinking about coming and decided not to for a variety of reasons that are going to regret that decision. They pieced together such a great team to put it on. Yeah. And of course, I can't not thank all the sponsors <laughs> for putting up the money to make it happen too. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's run through just some of the activities there, mainly to talk about it if you weren't there and maybe to reminisce if you were there and also for kind of archival purposes down the road. If this is the, you're listening and it's 25 years later and you want to know what happened at the Diamond Jubilee for the, what's the 100th? What is that? Gold, platinum, titanium, something. Unobtainium. Un unobtainium. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Land Rovers. Yeah. There might, series ones might be unobtainium by then. In activities, there were, there was off-roadings. There were 30, miles of trails of all different types and styles. I know people went out at, at all times. I suspect that Ned tried to hit all the trails. I don't know if he succeeded, but I did get to go out with him and his new defender he, that he calls a stormtrooper. And he actually let me drive for a short period of time on you know, just the regular green trails, but did get to drive and that was very nice. And that was a fun time. That was good. Very interesting, very good truck. There was, a, I think, at least one roll that I know of that was quickly extricated. You probably saw those videos. If you go out to our Instagram page, you'll see some of that. 
the Bill Burke went and kind of supervised to get the, was a D90 that had rolled on its side. It's kind of laid over. So they righted that back up. But I believe people found the trails to be challenging. Um, and then for those who were new, uh, I think they found the trails to be challenging too, because they, there were wide trails there that you could go on and you didn't have to risk the Pennsylvania pinstriping, as we like to call it here, to, to your truck. The interesting thing is that the trails, the amount of challenge varied with the day because of the weather, which, which adds another dimension to things. And I did get to take my 110 on a short run on, I think it was Thursday, because that's the dry day. I wanted the dry day, went with Charles Bell, and we just went out on a short 20 minute ride, went up to the top at the precipice, which is the overlook. I saw the picture. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And that was wide open trails. There was a little bit of like soft mud. It wasn't that it's dry mud, if that makes some sense. So kind of a little slushy, not wet mud. And tail end defender kicked out a little bit. It was fun. Nothing ever in getting concerned, but it was nice to get, at least get my own truck out. Well, it's just an observation at one point. I was up on the mountain with Mike Malone and Ben Smith's 80 inch when Convoy came by. And in the end, Conrad Claw came by and his navigator abandoned his new Defender 110 and wanted to ride in the 80 inch. So I had the opportunity to ride in Conrad's 110. Oh. And what was interesting was when we were coming down the ski slope and you could see the cars, the modern, especially modern ones, not pure wetting, but sliding down the hill and so on. And, and I watched the 110 with all the traction control lights going off and so on, trying to stay straight. And then looking back and seeing Mike in the 80 inch, just gracefully coming down the slope straight without any issues, which I guess 5,000 pounds or more of difference in weight goes and makes a difference. But it was an interesting thing to see. And um, also years of experience too. Yes. Ex experience but, and what's the difference in tires? I couldn't say. That's good hand. The 80 inch tires are not that aggressive. Okay. Either. But what was the 110 on street tires though? With Conrad, I would expect that he's got a 101 and a series one also. So I'd expect he knows tires. All right. Okay. It depends okay. if he changed what came from the dealer. I right. couldn't answer that. It was, it's just an interesting observation on the, the off-roading aspect of it on the trails. Score one for the 80 inch. We were talking about how so many things going on. And one thing I did not get to see was any of the RTV trials or even the NR Cup. There were five stages to the RTV trials and there were winners of that. Uh, there was the NR Cup, which was the inaugural NR Cup. And the idea there is to have that as a reoccurring activity throughout North America and then have that cup move around to different events. Those details are getting sorted out. But did any of you get to see a witness or see any of the RTV trials or the NR Cup competition? There are several parts to the NR Cup. There was the scavenger hunt where they had to go to predefined map locations on the mountain, find a, an image and a keyword and, and associate those together. There was the teams had to go and do the RT, the five stages, the RTV. And then there was a sixth stage set up next to the old Peak Central Resort Pavilion, which is now abandoned, but you could watch some um, the tracks deck and the display area for the cars of the vehicles going and doing the RTV. They had a tire change, remove the tire, bring it down to a stream and back up again and change tires, go forward. And then a rather ingenious winching competition between the teams where Bill Burke had put out a selection of rope, chain, high lift, some connecting pieces and so on, that with the vehicle 60 feet away, you had to move it. About 16 feet was the goal. You had 15 minutes to do it. No one made the full distance, but none of the pieces of rope or chain and so on was long enough to do it. So you had to put these things together and then figure out how to adjust things. It was an ingenious and somewhat evil challenge that made these teams really work and think about how to do it. It was an interesting thing. It was a good competition to watch. I remember hearing Steve Barrett under Power Hour doing some of the announcing for, I think, the final stage of the co cool to hear. He's doing the com color commentary. It was color. 
<laughs> you say that. Well, that was one of the nice things too, was to, to Camel Trophy style, they had the Team Spirit Award portion of the Cup Award too. So that was fun seeing people running around in various attire and such. The Minnesota Club had used their Range Rover Classic and put a drove all the way down with a canoe on top and competed with a canoe on top. <laughs> hey, kudos to them for, I think they, didn't they win the Team Spirit Award? They won Team Spirit, yes. Yeah. I think right, Plus that, the yeah. nice thing is under that canoe is probably nice and dry inside the Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> the only place that was nice and dry. I'm actually going to try and encourage the member clubs and so on to, to start doing the RT, doing more of the RTVs and so on under the same rules and such. So then scores from different club events across the country can start to get aggregated together and such. There's more coming on that. And I think that's going to be really fun because I know that Vermont Overland did have the Overland trophy that they did for a while there. It wasn't as frequent as their regular events, but it would really be nice to see that competition between the clubs and the participation of all the various clubs. And you got to give a shout out to Ned Crystal of the Defender Owners of New Hampshire. They did create the Anark Cup and did, did a really nice job on that. I don't know if you saw the cup, but it was pretty, it was gold, pretty big. And they did a lot of work on that. It, it was cool. So we'll shout out to Ned and his club. And hopefully the NARC Cup continues year to year. In addition to that, there was also Vendor Village and a, a car show. There was historic and modern vehicles on display in the Vendor Village area, which is right off of the track's deck. There were a number of pav uh, pavilions and tents that all the sponsors were there all in a, a really a short distance that you could walk easily between them. And that's where Widom was. Uh, just off the top of my head, there was, what, three brothers. There was LRC, Lucky 8, Sarek, Rovers North. Who am I missing? Uh, there was uh, Congleton. Congleton, thank you. Yes, and all, all had, and showing their wares and their activities. And that was really cool. But amongst that was the historic and the modern vehicle display. The historic over in the that kind of back big tent it was where Macri had brought center steer prototype and his... Excellent examples of a series when he had a two, three, and there was a, th he brought four vehicles, right? What was the fourth Yeah, one? he's got an early series brought, one as well. Series one. That was it. Series one. And, and then there was Bill Cooper brought the Pink Panther and, and did he bring the Tickford or was someone else? That, no, that example? no, the, the Tickford was from Virginia. No, Bill brought down a 2B forward control. He brought the Pink Panther. He brought a pair of 80 inches. That's what I recall offhand. Who brought the fire pumper, fire truck? The firefly was brought by Eric Zipkin, who also brought his father's expedition, Series 2 Expedition 109 that That's drove around right. the world and so on. Yeah, which I did talk to him about getting him on the podcast because we need to talk about that truck. And That's a really story-looking vehicle that had that weird bump in the uh, sun visor. And I think I was told that was for a camera. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So the passenger could take photos uh, looking forward and so on. And that'd be have that sun visor that was common back in that era, blocking your view. And the Land Rover also brought modern vehicles. And there was a modern Range Rover. There was a 130. That Defender 130, by the way, that red claret looking color was fantastic. I don't know if you guys saw that right at the bottom of the track yes. deck. That nice, deep red. I wonder if that's only available on that 130, but that was a, I'm sure limit that to what vehicles you can get in, but that was a nice color. Then they had other Range Rovers and uh, I think they, did they have a disco there? I think I did see the disco. And then they sponsored Land Rover Lounge up on track's deck. So there was free coffee all day for three days in a row. And that's where <laughs> my, this is my one complaint about Land Rover Lounge you're a British company originally, and there was no tea. They had no tea. Thankfully, I found <laughs> Widom Engineering. They took care of me. Actually, I noticed that too. I went there looking for tea and didn't find any. The coffee was excellent. I don't, I'm not a coffee guy, but I did hear the coffee was excellent. They had one bag of tea, and I got it the very first time I went up. I said, do you guys have tea? Like, I got one bag. I'm like, I'll take it. And But then, thankfully, I found... But I take to these events anymore. I travel with my own tea because I know the default, in, especially America, is coffee. So I take my own tea just in case, and I'm glad I did. But I also am glad mm. I found Widom Engineering. 
Because here in America, we take the tea and we throw it in the harbor. That's right. <laughs> And thanks to Land Rover for helping out, and especially with that Land Rover Lounge. That was pretty cool. They had the, the nice little setup there that you could hang out on track's deck and see what was going on during the event. Very well done event overall. Yeah, and I guess the one one dinner activity is taught the Jubilee, which was in another location up on the hill next to the the lodge. And we had to have it on the Friday because I had forgotten this until I got there, but there was a wedding <laughs> That was taking place on Saturday and they were having a wedding at the overlook or the lookout they called the lookout. And so that's why we had to have our dinner on Friday at the Greek peak folks. We got out of there. What about 11 o'clock? I think on Friday and they had to turn that place around for a wedding the next day. And the only complaint I heard about dinner aside from you couldn't get tickets, we had a limit to 600 to the capacity of that venue was the speakers in there were terrible. It was difficult uh, to hear Tough people to, on the outside. Could hear clearly and in the bathrooms apparently this that was yes. very clear but in the main <laughs> hall it was garbled exactly yeah i did hear that from several people like i went to the bathroom and it was great i can hear the numbers because we did the raffle <laughs> <laughs> so that's where bill burke got an award from a narc and mark latourne rovers north also got an award from a narc for their contributions to the land rover community in north america that was lifetime nice. achievement awards basically yes yeah absolutely yeah, well deserved. Well deserved. And that's it our place. Brought old Bill to tears on that one. It did. Yeah. It did. His posts after the event, he, he tried to write several times and it would always bring him to tears. And it took him several tries before he get the post out there to, to thank everyone. And the farewell Saturday party with a bonfire and ice cream social. And to be open and honest, I was out of energy out of juice. I went over and hung out with my club, the Fort Pitt folks, and I just hung out with them. I could hear what was going on. I knew the movie was happening and, and ran out of ice cream. And I saw the pictures of the bonfire. Kind of like three parties in one, because there was the fire, there was the movie, and then there was a band playing. So you couldn't hear the movie. It was kind of like <laughs> three different things all jammed into one place. Yeah, I think you listen to the movie on the app. As, yeah, as, yeah as but the, you, you got to be somewhere else so you're not drowned out by the, you'd have to like have headphones on or something, noise canceling headphones. Yeah, it was. We, we, we sat up in the campsite in the back of Morgan's truck and watched the movie from there. Oh, cool. Exactly. Yeah, it was convenient that we had just the right view from there. So once we figured out the radio station, it was fun to watch, watch the movie from there. Classic. Uh, Oh yeah, and everything everything worked out for the, for the for the series truck. I forget is that series two or three? And Gods must be crazy. Series one. Series, it's series one. one. Oh, it's a one. Okay, it's a series one. Oh yes. Oh, there you go. There and we, in fact, we've decided there needs to be a new event for the Anarch Cup, and that is driving it backwards while standing on the bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also the bonus of the doing the RTV course with no use of brakes but one rock that you can carry with you. Uh -huh. Instead of just having to get through the gates, you have to stop before the gate and then go through the gate. Open it, get through it, close it. We had several honorees that also did some exhibition sessions and they talked. I did get to see Kim McCullough and Nick Rogers. I didn't get the chance to get to the other honorees, luminaries, what we like to call them that were there, but it was, that was, everybody seemed to have a great time. They did great talks. The two that I saw, I remember Nick Rogers helped out by the way, on the Freelander. And so I made sure to make, we won't hold that. it against him. <laughs> that was great for all those folks to be there. You would walk from one of the part of vendor village to go up to tracks deck and you'd pass Bill Burke. You'd see Kim McCullough. They're just like right there and all very nice people. They were all nice to talk to. They seemed very happy and pleased to be there and see the event. So it was great. And not to forget our cousins in podcasting, the Underpower Hour, they had set up a live podcast pavilion and they did daily podcasts from there and talked to Jeff Aronson. They're just, it was nice to see those guys in person. And that was great. They were just real nice people and a shout out to them. I for brought all out help. his series too, which was formerly owned by Steve McQueen. Thank you. I almost forgot about that. That's right. We saw a Steve McQueen series truck. How can I forget about that one? That was another yeah, highlight. Does, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really get much better than that or no. cooler than that, I should say. And a great patina on that thing. And we also got to see David Short present 
the travels of the cross country travels of Oxford. In That's America. one another one so I missed. Was, I'm sorry, David. That was really great. Including so, a bit of content which has not been published yet. Yes, in fact, a fair amount of content that hasn't been published yet. So it was nice to see the highlights from the whole thing. And there's going to be a lot more. There's already quite a bit on YouTube. And there's definitely going to be a lot more coming on YouTube to watch there. And with far more detail than he was able to pack into his presentation. Yeah, I know they did a lot of work on registration. He wanted to have more of the Oxford in America posted on YouTube, but he's just been so busy with things. Then he decided to help out with the NARC and registration. So <laughs> it, yeah, that, that made it a little difficult. I missed that one. I wish I had seen that. But as, as we said, there was so much activity going on. You didn't want to miss anything, but at the same time, you had to miss something because you, if you weren't on the trail, you were at an expo session. If you weren't at an expo session, you were talking to a, a vendor or you were trying to get some food. And the, by the way, the food at Greek Peak was wonderful. I didn't have a bad meal there. Yeah, I think overall, Greek Peak was really a great venue. It worked you know, out really well. Yeah, they served us well. It was it was nice to be able to take over the whole location and have activities for kids and families just in terms of the water park and the they could do the chairlift rides and stuff like that. So it really was not only was it completely every minute was packed with activities for the Land Rover fan, but there was even more to do. If you wanted to. Yeah, there was something for everybody. My only complaint for Greek Peak was at the entrance to the lodge, they play all the time the, that nighttime sounds. <laughs> I like them, but come on, don't pump them in artificially. It's just, it was too loud. Uh, all you heard those crickets and the night bugs going off. And it was like, what is that? Is it, is that, no, that's not rain. For a while there, we thought somebody's truck was idling with a loose fan belt or something until we heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until we heard the loop restart. <laughs> We're like, oh, no, no. I had a good time. I know my dog had a good time. He just had so much fun meeting everyone and all the kids. Like every last kid in the place wanted to pet him. And that was just awesome for him. He loved that. And if anybody took any pictures of him, please send them to me because my hands were way too full to get out of camera. And it would have been ripped right out of my hands by him dragging me. So if anybody has any pictures, please send them to me. I would really appreciate it. Yeah, that was a three-hander dog, not two hands wasn't enough. You needed yeah. three. Yeah, eventually I went on belay, had him around my waist, and it still was very hard. I was leaned back at like 45 degrees most of the time. And the yeah, funny I thing was... is I get home and his leash manners are impeccable again. <laughs> he, uh, and every once in a while he'd hand him over to me and he was fine. Yeah, yeah. And when we had him tethered at the campsite, he was fine. So he went home and his leash has literally never been taught. He was all excited by all the Land Rovers. He was just ex excited by, yeah, the whole experience just had him. He just couldn't remember his manners. We'll wrap up by doing a little another roundtable of what might you want to see at, for a Land Rover 100 or some advice you'd like to give to the organizers of Land Rover 100. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that Land Rover makes it to then and that there's still a community that would like to celebrate Land Rover in its 100th year in 2048. You now have 25 years to get your Rover ready. <laughs> get started now. That's 288 uh, months. <laughs> Morgan, you have anything, advice or thing that you'd like to see in Land Rover 100? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Land Rover vehicles are like at that point. Because really, I don't know that anybody could have imagined what Land Rovers would be available now back at the 50th. Obviously, that's just in my imagination. I just, I cannot actually put my finger on what one might actually be like. But... I really hope that it's not in the metaverse. It, it has to be a real physical outside <laughs> event with, doing with actual trucks. Yeah. With actual trucks, actual real weather. leaking oil. Yeah. Coming home from this event, being totally physically and mentally exhausted from all the fun. It has to be that kind of event. 
Yeah, it yeah. took me about three days to properly recover. And let's get a pool going for 25 years from now. Are there going to be more new defenders or freelanders at the event? Oh, definitely new defenders. You think so? How many of them oh. do you think are still going to be running? Yeah, yeah there's but there's more, of, more them. of them than there ever were freelanders. I, I don't think that going to be in question. I think those will still continue. Yeah, but 25 years from now, maybe the Freelander will have made a comeback. Some sort of people will start driving them ironically or something. So, Harold, do you have any thoughts then to Land Rover 100 or anything you'd like to see in Land Rover 100? I'd like to see Oxford, the 100. Mm. Yes. That's, that's As a special guest. That's it. That would be it. Yes, Oxford's heading back to the UK and then back into the hands of Adam Bennett. As we speak. Who has not seen his truck in years. Spent all that money finding it and fixing it up, and then he just gave it to the world. Which is a good thing. Oh, no, it's amazing. I don't know anybody else that would even consider doing that. We owe a great debt of gratitude to Adam for sharing his truck with all of us. Dixon, is there anything you'd like to see at Land Rover 100 or some advice? I'd like it a longer event so one could go and do things. I'd be curious to see what will be the next vehicle to replace the NAS Freelander in terms of will they beat out the number of 80 inches there. And that's hard to say after that. It's, it was such a fantastic event and the automotive scene is going to change so dramatically. It's hard to say, but I'd certainly like to be there and do the RTV and enjoy it. You did a great job of leaning into what would be my advice for Land Rover 100. And that is actually let people drive the vehicles. Because I suspect that, as you said, the automotive world's going to change. There's less people that are interested in driving. And then the type of vehicles are changing. There's probably going to be more automated driving and there will be less drivers uh, of actual vehicles. And so... I think having that experience of putting people behind the wheel and drive a stick that is, maybe it's all electric, maybe it's converted, maybe it's still an ice engine, whatever. But I think actually put them behind the wheel, see what it's like. And actually driving a series truck or a Defender is fairly easy. The clutch, excuse me, the manual transmission is fairly forgiving for someone who is new to that, unlike the mm -hmm. Volkswagen Jetta <laughs> TDI. But a good way to put so that maybe that's your Land Rover experience. Well, actually, well, drive a 1980 Series Three. I think that the, actually, the, yeah, it's the transmission and the clutch and the gearing and everything. But that's now my vehicle of choice for teaching people to drive manual transmission because you can learn to operate one foot at a time. You don't need to synchronize your pedals. Yeah, and low range is really helpful for teaching someone how to use the clutch. You're difficult to stall and you're going to, you're not going to go fast and it's not going to get away from you. Any final thoughts on the Diamond Jubilee? There was a lot to do. It was, I think, well pulled off. And admittedly, Dixon and I were on the planning team, so we're a little bit biased, but I think everything we heard, it went well. There were no problems. <laughs> there were problems. But hey, we won't talk about those. But there, there were certainly issues and things we could have done better, and that will come out in the wash as we continue to talk about it on the planning side. For an event of that magnitude, I think there were fewer problems than I would have expected. Yes, Hello, your sure. surveys, people. So that was Narcs Diamond Jubilee celebrating Land Rovers 75 years. That was our experience. We were all there at the same time, and I think it was a great event. Great event. I hope we're all around for Land Rover 100. <laughs> the podcast yes. continues. I'll be, I was no, uh, noting during the event that Land Rover 100, I will be 80 years old. But you'll need to bring an 80 inch. Oh yeah. Maybe by then I'll have a, I'd have an 80 inch. That'd be interesting. That'd be cool. Truthfully, before the event, since my Land Rover was not going to be ready in time, I tried to find one of the official Land Rover mountain bikes to bring to the event. Those are actually harder to find than a Freelander. The genuine ones. There's some, uh, actually a lot of knockoff Land Rover mountain bikes out there. But yeah, who knows? Maybe one of those will show up. I've seen some that look like somebody just went down to Walmart and bought a cheap bike and threw Land Rover stickers on it. Yeah, that's pretty much what most of them are. But they have actually partnered with a few high-end bicycle manufacturers over the years. You can spot the genuine ones, though, by the oil leaks. 
<laughs> yes. Although I think we've hit upon what we'd like to see for Land Rover 100th, and that is Morgan Aldridge behind the wheel of his own Land Rover. Sir, you have yes. 25 years. <laughs> We're now exactly. challenging you. We're challenging you for Land Rover 100. You need to be behind the wheel of your own Land Rover, sir. Agreed. You have 300 months. Get a bunch 1,550 that. weeks. If I replace one piece a week, that should be you one part of week. Might it make it. Minimal. You might make it. Knightsbridge Overland Sea Covers help protect your classic Land Rover, whether you're on the trail or cruising around town. They're the perfect solution for protecting your pristine Land Rover seats or to cover up your well-worn and aged seats. Each seat cover is hand-cut and sewn in the USA for a custom fit that looks like it's straight from the factory. Every seat cover is crafted using 600 denier Cordera material. It's waterproof, oil, and dust resistant. And I'm now going to add to that bird crap resistant. So I park my vehicle and I've been having this bird crap all over the outside of the vehicle. And I don't know why I've looked for a nest. I couldn't find it. Don't know what's happening, but the bird every day would crap on the vehicle and I'd wash it off. And one day it came out last week and I'd left the windows down because the weather was nice. And the bird had gotten inside and crapped on the driver's seat and the passenger seat behind the driver's seat, right on the seat covers. I got a bucket of water, wipe those seats right off. And they dried up. They look great. They, they, like it never happened. So I'm now adding to that bird crap resistant. Does the bird actually land on your 110 before it does this? Or is it a low altitude bombing run? I think it's hanging out on the roof rack. Knightsbridge Overland seat covers are designed to be extremely comfortable and keep you warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer while providing protection against mud, dart, grime, and bird crap. And more, Knightsbridge Overland seat covers are available for most classic Land Rovers, including Series, Defender, Discovery, and Range Rover. Select Knightsbridge Overland seat covers that's right for your Rover. Available in both tactical and non-tactical versions in four colors, black, tan, mocha, and gray. I have the mocha in my truck. Our tactical seat covers include military-grade Molly webbing that accommodates pouches, weapons, tools, First aid kits and more non-tactical seat covers feature three handy pockets for much needed extra storage in your Land Rover. They're very handy. Visit KnightsbridgeOverland.com and enter Steer 10 at checkout for 10% off your Knightsbridge Overland seat cover order. That's KnightsbridgeOverland.com and enter Steer 10 for 10% off your order. Protect and enhance your Land Rover seats with Knightsbridge Overland. And now welcome to the podcast. It is Greg Fitzgerald. Greg, you are editor of the Rover Log with Atlantic British. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, John. You are speaking from the back. You're the second guest now to be inside their discovery. You're in a decided discovery three. And you're, where are you? I am actually currently in Algonac, Michigan. I think it's called Algonac, at the north end of Lake St. Clair. I'm on a month long trip to the Great Lakes region, exploring some of my other hobbies. And just living out of my truck. Nice. The hobby that brings you to the podcast is Barbara Toy. For those who don't know, she's written several books and had traveled in her in two different Land Rovers and I think some other vehicles too, if I'm not mistaken, throughout the world. And she passed, I think, in 2008. Uh, 2001. 2001. Thank you. So you are able to get one of her books republished. And that's the main reason we have you on the podcast, because that's coming up and we want to tell people about the book and how they can get it. So what is the book and what's the significance of, of this uh, Barbara Toy book? So the book that is coming back in print is In Search of Sheba, which was about her 1959 journey to East Africa in actually a Series 288. She's most famous for her Series 1 Pollyanna, which I think was a 1950 like factory vehicle. By the late 50s, she'd been prominent enough that Land Rover decided that they didn't really want her driving around the world in their old car. So they swapped her Pollyanna for a Series 2, and this was her first journey in Series 2. What did she name the Series 2? So Barbara Toy, I think you guys have had my partner in crime on this project, Ashley Giordano. You've had Bill Cooper. So we've got a lot of Barbara Toy, a lot of Barbara Toy background if you're a center steer listener at this point. We all know Pollyanna. The Series 2 era was the back end of her writing career, which had ended by the mid-60s. There seemed to have actually been, I believe, more than one Series 2. 
there was an 88 and I think a 109 for the trip after this one. And I don't know if they had names ever or if they, she didn't like them. She didn't like Series 2s. And I'm not sure that they ever really deserve names in her mind. Since she didn't connect with it, she may not have actually named them. There's a great quote that I'm at the beginning of this book from the day that she drove the Series 2 out of Solly Hull. If you want me to read it. The engine hummed quietly and I felt the extra power. The windscreen wipers moved in a steady rhythm. Two of them. Big deal. I passed the high gateway out of the rover company and turned left. It was incredibly difficult to see anything. The damned snow. The damned road. This damned car, I said to myself. I can't see a damned thing and wipe the tears from my eyes. But not really how a lot of us feel when we buy a new Land Rover, I don't think. <laughs> Or even a new old one. No. In Search of Sheba, tell us more about that book. Once she actually got on the road, it's one of her most fascinating journeys. Barbara made a lot of her name and her fame exploring the Middle East and North Africa. Going to Libya, Saudi Arabia. Obviously, her Columbus Was Right journey, which Bill Cooper replicated the North American part of a couple of years ago, was around the world journey. This was the first time that she went more more south into Africa. So she went to East Africa via the Congo into Ethiopia and I believe Kenya as well. It's a new terrain for her in her stories for sure. And which is what makes it an interesting book compared to her really deep focus over her history on the kind of the Arabian Peninsula and the Mediterranean. And have you been able to read the book? I have not read the book. So this is actually if we want to get it to kind of have this project started. I think a lot of us know Barbara Toy books are very expensive. And yes. difficult to get a hold of. Print. Yes. They're very difficult to get a hold of. This is slightly easier than some of the earliest books to get a hold of, but it's still not super easy to find. This has been a multi-year journey to get it republished. It started out as Ashley and I, over different periods of time, working on separate solo projects and then coming together and actually achieving the goal. So I have not read the book and I actually am very excited to because that was actually the point of this whole journey was to get a book of hers republished so that her story gets back in the public. How did that come about to the, getting this particular book and why why In Search of Sheba and not one of her other books? Well, let's do the, a bit of the long story. So this, this actually starts with an article I wrote for Rover Log in March of 2019. It was a Women's History Month that I was looking for Let's write about some women in Land Rover. And Barbara Toy was an obvious choice that I hadn't spotlighted yet. So I put an article together on her that ended up being, I did some research into some old Australian magazines of the period that had interviews with her and all, and built a bit of a fuller picture than I'd seen before. And I became really fascinated with her. And later in that year, I became very interested in trying to get one of her books republished. My day job is in the publishing industry. I had a kind of an idea of how to make that work. And I really wanted to get her books back in print. Totally having no idea how to do it. No personal connections to Barbara. The person that I pinged was Michael Bishop, who works for Land Rover Classic in Coventry. And is also just a diehard Land Rover nerd on his own. And I figured he might have a connection. And it turns out that he actually knew Barbara personally in the 90s. Oh, wow. I did um, not know that. Okay. Yeah. So Barbara was actually Australian. And Michael's also Australian. And I guess they, they both emigrated to Britain and met each other on the British Land Rover circuit, especially the Series 1 circuit in the 90s. He had a period of a couple of years where they became friends and overlapped before she died in 2001. He gave me some advice and he gave me one piece of advice also that I didn't know as an American, which is for a couple of pounds, you can buy a copy of anyone's will in Britain on the internet to go into this ministry of whatever. Ministry of wills and uh, special scrolls. And, and some thing that left existed in 1450. And uh, they, they send you a copy of the will, like a couple hours later, as a PDF. I got the will. This is a gold mine. It says, all my publication rights are given to my nephew, whose name is escaping me at the moment. So I'm like, great, this sounds really easy. So I Google the nephew. Because I got a name to work with. And what I find for the nephew is an obituary in the Sydney Morning Herald. They oh. did about three weeks before the day I started this project. Oh, wow. Oh, my. It's very poor timing. 
Yeah. The good news is that he has a widow listed in the obituary. So I know that there's someone to contact. The trail hasn't gone completely cold. It's an easier way for the, uh, the asset would transfer to her, presumably. But I'm not a tacky person, and I wasn't going to call her three weeks after her long beloved husband died and say, hey, your husband's aunt had these books. You want to think about that right now on top of everything? Don't you understand who I am and what I'm doing? <laughs> exactly, right? Don't you know? Right. They actually live in her house. She also oh. gave him the house. Barbara Toy had no children. And I guess he might have been like a favorite nephew or something. So it was all really easy. I just needed to wait for a tactful moment. And I thought, I'll deal with this next spring. And then the spring of 2020 happened, and this was not something I was thinking about. I let this sit for a couple of years, but I had all this information ready to go. And that spring, Ashley Giordano, Ashley is not a land of her person, but she exudes this spirit. And one day we will possibly try and convert her and her husband Richard from their Toyota ways. We now, tried. We've talked to her, so we tried. We've tried. Yes. If you keep in touch with the O General Overland world, you might know her and Richard as their Project Dest for Glory, mm -hmm. where in 2013, I think, they took a, a Toyota pickup truck, like it was Tacoma, or maybe it was before the Tacoma. They drove to, they drove Pan America, so she's been very involved in Overland since. And she was, she's now the, I think, the senior editor at Expedition Portal and Overland Journal and wanted to talk about women more and became fascinated with Barbara Toy in that process. Started a Instagram, Facebook channel called Finding Barbara Toy. Right, there is an Instagram, where, that's correct, with Finding Barbara Toy. You should follow that yep. if you're at all interested in Barbara Toy. We'll have a link, of course, in the show notes. Definitely. And she was trying to get the books republished. So I sent her an Instagram message and I'm like, we have the same goal, let's work together on it. We collaborated on this. We started trying to figure out how to write The Widow. By then, it had been a couple of years, so we figured we could do that now. And we started working a couple angles. And we were getting to the point where we were starting to figure out how to work with UK publication law. And she got in touch with Lois Price, who was a motorcycle overlander, who has written three of the best overland books I've ever written. Um, one about a Pan, a Pan American trip about 20 years ago. One about a Trans-Africa trip and one called Revolutionary Ride in which she ships her motorcycle to Iran and rides it around Iran in about 2013, 2014, when there was that kind of quiet period, which is one of my favorite travelogues I've ever read. She got in touch with Lois and Lois got us in touch with this guy at John Murray Press, a cunt, who was working on a series at John Murray called John Murray Journeys. So John Murray Press is a British publisher, Barbara's original publishing house in the UK. John Murray Journeys is a project to republish mid-century travelogues. The British had a beautiful mid-century travelogue tradition, and they're trying to bring some of them back. Long story, pretty much short, this was a perfect fit for the program, and they slotted it into the 2023 catalog. Excellent. Excellent. And how will folks be able to order that book? The best way to order it, it is published in the United Kingdom. It is not published in the U.S. However, it is pretty easy to order a book from the U.K. and have it shipped here for, for very little or no money. And we do benefit from a strong exchange rate right now, as we are, I'm sure, aware owning Land Rivers. The best way, and I'll get you the link to put in the show notes from the publisher in the U.K. It has a listing of all the ways to buy it at a bunch of British bookstores and pretty much just pick one. There's one or two that usually have a free international thing. It'll be able to tell you're not in the UK and you can get it shipped here. It's about, I think, 13 pounds. Is it a hardback, paperback? Paperback. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think there may be an ebook, although that may be difficult to get. I don't know if there's an international rights issue with that. So you basically can get it from any British bookstore and we'll have a link to the list of ones that are being supplied by the publisher. And then you can just order it, and find the best one for you to get the book delivered to you, especially if you're here exactly. in the U.S. or you're in Canada. But, yes, for, the, for our British listeners, go down to your local. and Yeah, and, much you know. easier for you guys. Yes. Go to the local Waterstones or something and pick it up. Right. Yeah, you don't need us to help you with that. No. 
Now, can you pre-order it or do you have to wait until it goes on sale? And when does it go uh, on sale? You should sale? be able to pre-order it. Most bookstores will have some kind of pre-order situation. The name will be In Search of Sheba? The Is name it? remains In Search of Sheba, the original title, yes. And by Barbara Toy herself. Correct. The forward is by Lois Price, the motorcycle writer I was just telling you about. Excellent. So excellent. she's done a reintroduction to the title. Oh, excellent. Okay. And this book was originally published in 61. originally in 61. Yep. And that was her fifth journey that was undertaken in 1959. Yes, I'm checking out Barbara Toy's Wikipedia page and just confirming some of the things that we talked about. Pollyanna is a 1950 80-inch soft top series one. He built a hard top for it later because... The soft top's only fun for so long traveling long term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's a good point. Excellent point. Are there any other of her books planned? Or do you think maybe if this goes well enough, there's enough demand, maybe they'll add some of her other books. She's written like about, what, about six or eight books. One of them was republished in 2009. It was called In the Footsteps of the Levant, something about the Levant. Traveling the incense route from Moravia yeah, to the Levant in the footsteps of the Magi. That, I believe, is actually the way of the chariots reprinted, if I remember. I thought that was a posthumous book for a while that it, they found the manuscript for, but it's actually a reprint and retitle. That was printed in 2009, and they did not pursue any of the further books at that point. That is the only other one that has been printed again in modern times. And that's pretty easy to find used online. Wikipedia shows all the books under John Murray here. There's eight of them. And as you said, they list the 09 book as a posthumous book, but I wouldn't, yeah, like you said, I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of the previous versions. They just didn't fully understand. Yeah. And that was part of another vintage travelogue series that some other publisher did 15 years ago. For books to come out. I would say that it depends on how well this does. So if you want to get your hands on, especially some of the earliest and rarest books, her first three were The Fool books, A Fool on Wheels, her first one about driving to Iraq, A Fool in the Desert, and A Fool Strikes Oil, which was her Saudi trip. Those are considered the three rarest vintage books. And certainly those are, would be fabulous to get reprinted. So buy this one and only good things can continue. I recall looking um, several years ago for those books and they were in the hundreds of dollars to find yeah, some a used version somewhere in the world. Not a beach read, more of a acid free gloves in a safe room read. Visit centersteer.com, go to the show notes for this particular episode of the podcast, and we'll have a link to all of what Greg has indicated is so you can buy the book from a UK bookseller. We'll have a link to that as a list of those, and especially if you're here. In the in North America, go ahead and pick up the book. If you're in Australia, pick up the book, wherever you are, anywhere in the world. We need to s- spread the good works of Barbara Toy. Many ways of going out and traveling. She traveled before the boys did in, in 1559 on the first overland. Yep. And she was all self-funded and self-supported and very much a pioneer in overlanding. There's really only one person who's known to have done much before her. There was a, and Dixon may have some thoughts on this. There was a Colonel LeBlanc who was sent by a rover to do setting up a sales network in Africa and the Middle East. And he did a trip in 49, actually, with an 80 inch that he drove into Ethiopia which my understanding is considered the first person to quote unquote, do an expedition with a Land Rover. I never heard that, was interesting. Yeah, if there's very little information on Colonel LeBlanc. There were a few of them that did that. Then there was also my hall that went across Canada at about the same right. time. And very little is known about that also, unfortunately. Were those all like that business is- trips put on by Land Rover? These two examples, yes, it was Land Rover trying to go and establish dealer networks and such. But it's 1949 in Ethiopia, so it's an expedition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or Canada, really. I mean, Canada, still, yeah. There, yeah. There's some debate on how far Mile actually got on his Canadian journey. Mm. I was discussing this with a friend in Vancouver, and he's like, I don't think you could have driven to Vancouver in 1949. He could have. Like, yeah, you could have. It was not a Land Rover. Of course he could have. This is true. It's an expedition at that point. Yeah, it would have been an expedition. Well, Barbara was very early, especially her first trips to the Middle East. 
And the fact that she was a woman doing it alone was really incredible. So it's not just the fact that she wasn't just the first woman to do this stuff, but really the first person to do this stuff is what I think makes her incredible. She beat the Oxbridge expeditions for the long-term travel thing by several years. The, the first overland trip, the one that we obviously all know, Oxford, that we had here in North America a couple of years ago, that trip beat her on that run by a couple months. She was always just slightly behind them, which I think had more to do with her overall itinerary than any kind of lack of confidence Barbara Toy had in driving to Singapore. It wasn't her first rodeo at that point, so she would have had the confidence necessary. Exactly. She just happened to be a couple months behind them. But yeah, really incredible what she did. And with an 80 inch, which just proves an 80 inch can do anything. That's where the story lies. And I think that we've really had this wonderful Barbara Toy renaissance in the past couple of years. I know Scar started doing it a couple of years ago and with the Barbara Toy runs and you all know everything about her at this point. So just go read the book and read it firsthand. Now, now it's your opportunity to actually read an actual Barbara Toy book. This is your chance. Right. This is your opportunity for a reasonable amount of money too. You're not going to have to right. dish out for a used first edition that you don't know the, the condition of, and you don't have to worry about right. breaking the spine or damaging the book. You don't, exactly. have to just, don't have to decide which rover port parts you're going to forego in order to afford the book. Some of them, it's which rover you're going to forego. Greg, you are not only the editor for Rover Log at Atlantic British, but you're a rover owner yourself. How did you get into rover ownership? So um, I've got a different story than maybe some others. I'm 33. So I came into it through the, the coiler. Gotcha. D is, does the oh. disco have anything to do with it that you're sitting in at the moment? This one, no, but another one, yes. Okay. My parents bought one of the first D1s imported to the U.S. in 1994. Oh, nice. They were expecting my brother. They needed a larger family vehicle than my mom's Saab 900. And she was flipping through, I think it was either the New York Post or the Daily News. I actually still have the review she ripped out. And it was the new discovery. They just got on the press drives and she was like, I want this car. This car is cool. They bought one. We took delivery Labor Day weekend, 94. And uh, it came with that video, the La Ruta Maya video. And some of us, oh, may yeah. have, they would have sent you, they gave you a video, basically how to use the off-road stuff, which they filmed on the North American press launch in Guatemala, Belize. You still have that video? I still have that video. And I still have the videos they sent you every couple months with, it had like camel trophy snippets in it, like kind of the whole lifestyle thing. Oh. Everything they would put on YouTube today, but it was on a tape because it was the nineties. Oh, so this is VHS. This is VHS not tapes, e absolutely. Not even CD, DVD. Wow. No, nope. they're mailing them to you every couple of months. Yeah, it was like Land Rover Adventures, Land Rover Adventures wow. Volume 2, Volume 3, and they just send them to owners every year or so. That I just fell in love with the idea that it wasn't just a soccer mom car. Did, did your mother take you to soccer or your brother? My brother, yes. I was not athletic enough for that. <laughs> so it was a soccer car. So it was. <laughs> it was a soccer car. Well, it was like the three-year-old soccer where they all just run in a circle with each other. Fair enough. Yeah. Did your mom name the vehicle? She never named the vehicle. So she yeah. had that one. She had a 01 D2. When she got that, she gave the D1 to my dad. He drove it a couple of years. It got totaled by a tree branch to the B pillar in a nor'easter, unfortunately. Ooh. They were going to give it to me. My dad was going to get a Suburban to carry everyone down the beach and all with when I got my license. And so he basically just said, you have a couple thousand dollars that I got from the insurance company, buy whatever you want with it. And I ended up with a 93 classic long wheelbase as my first car. Ooh, nice. So I, I drove a classic in high school when they weren't cool and they were cheap. Back when you could get one for a couple thousand from the insurance company. Exactly. And you can't do that anymore. I think it was $3,200 and had 123K on it. I got it from Virginia. Black over tan, 94 long wheelbase, that peanut butter leather that anyone who owns one knows just falls apart on you. Drove that until 14 or 15, got a D1 out of a field that I completely rebuilt and then drove to California that was identical to the first one. So that was like a nostalgia trip. Drove that for a couple of years. And then about two years ago, I picked up the 2005 LR3 that I'm sitting in right now, which I've put 50,000 miles on in a little over two years. And I work from home. So there's no commuting in that. Is home the discovery or? Like it kind of has been for long periods of time. I think I've spent about two months living out the back of this thing. Nice. nice. And is um, that all for AB to write for AB? 
Uh, it becomes articles. It's for fun. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I try and make anything interesting I do into an article. It helps to it, pay the bills, too. It helps to pay the bills. Always helps to pay the bills. Is is that original discovery that your parents had still in the in the family? No, as I said, that one got that one got totaled. Oh, I thought the second one got totaled. I'm sorry. Oh uh, no, the first one got totaled. Sorry. Oh, yeah. that's a shame. But yeah. the one that I have now is identical. Same year, same specification, same colorways. Looks rare. Coniston green, well, a very common fender mm. color, was somewhat rare on discoveries. Oh. I don't know that I've ever seen one in that yeah. color. It's funny because it looks fantastic on the D1. It's a really meant to be color, but it actually did not sell that. And they did continue to the after 95. Is that a manual or automatic? Automatic. Okay. I, I don't care that much. Was the original D1 that you had, was that manual or automatic? That was also an automatic. Okay. That's um, fine. I just was curious because I know that was the short period of time when you could get a discovery yeah. in a stick. I, I remember my dad said they did look at the dealership at one. It was in Caprice Teal, which is an even rarer color than Coniston Green. Yes. And that one he did say, I remember he said he had a manual and he's like, I test drove this thing with a stick shift, which seemed very weird even then for the price bracket the car was in. Little does he know now, that would be like killer. Yeah. That's just a, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, they held their value better than the automatic counterparts. Yeah, which there's, there are some people who say the automatics are better transmissions. I guess that's a hot take. One, those people are people who don't know how to drive a manual properly. The auto box is a, it's a ZF box, which is very right. durable. And the manual is from the R380s, the final incarnation of Rover trying to figure things out after the LT77 debacles. You know, losing that truck was a bummer. We got it when I was in, I think, kindergarten. So we, like, my mom would drive me, like, carpool. I would sit in one of the jump seats in the back, and then all my friends would have a weekly rotation who got to sit back there. <laughs> that it was, was a really cool thing. Oh, that was all. So you were the cool kid then. Mom had the cool. I was the cool kid. Yeah, I was totally the cool kid. That was Um, Who gets to sit with Greg this week? Oh, there was a schedule. (laughs) That's great. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I'll bet none of your friends now covet that third row seat. It's not that bad to sit in, actually. I'm like 6'3", and I actually, I sit back there. When I'm like doing a trip and I got to get a little work done, not a bad place to Pop the seat down and throw the laptop on your lap. I was mm-hmm. surprised. He is still a bit younger than us, Harold. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's much higher off the ground than some of the later ones. It's actually like stool height. So it's... It's the, ge- it's the getting in and out of the third row, I think, that is the extra challenge for some of us. That is true. Those were side-facing, weren't they? Yeah, they were inwards. So you'd open the tailgate on the Discovery. Yeah. You just kind of yeah. had to bustle yourself in there. And a lot of them came with those drop down steps, many which are gone because they dropped down and never came up again. Dropped down and got ripped off. Exactly. Sure. We all think them well for off-roading reasons, but there was a moment when they were in their sad used car era that you just saw discoveries driving around the country with steps a foot and a foot, half below the bumper. Yeah, you know, I think that the side facing seat is the lure for kids because it's different. Exactly. And I would actually say that it was probably, it was the, the D2s were tough to get into even as a kid. They had those weird, you like flipped them down and slammed them on the floor and picked them up. And you had to crawl through the aisle between them. And that was never as easy to get into even when I was like 9, 10, 11 or whatever. And then this LR3 is a five-seater, but I think these got a lot easier because you access them through the second row instead of from behind. So I, I think they tilt forward or something. I don't know. I don't have that version of the second row seat. If you're a kid, you just climb over. And there's that too. Are you more of an overlander? Do you do trail ride? What's your, uh, what's your general usage of the Discovery? Mostly overlanding, more than hardcore rock crawling kind of trails. Taking this thing out west once, planning to do it again before the end of the year. So this is all an on-road trip that I'm doing right now. But it's, it really is a car that kind of does anything, I feel like. So I've done everything with it. Are you traveling, a, a, traveling alone in a Land Rover? I guess I'm like a modern day male Barbara toy. That sounds like it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just go get in the truck and go. Right. Yeah. And we had Steve Owen travel to the Diamond Jubilee in a Series 1. He was sure to have folks join him on the trip. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you never know. <laughs> you never know. 
that's the nice thing about a modern discovery. You can, in fact, travel the highways of North America. Yeah. We're not going to say what we travel at because this is like on the record. It's a speed limit. You do not exceed the speed limit. Never an inch over. No, never. Yeah. That's why he's rebuilding a 109 pickup series two. So he will be ensure that he will never exceed the speed limit anywhere in the United States. Yes. Even school zones. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. That's good. That was a good one. Yeah. Even in active school zones, 15 miles an hour. You have another Land Rover in the fleet? I do have a 61 Series 2 109 pickup project, which, as Dixon knows, is severely stalled. I've picked up this project vehicle with the idea to put it on the chassis of my old Range Rover and build a hybrid. That was a very good idea in 2019 when I didn't have the workplace flexibility to do what I'm doing right now. And I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with it right now. Something will happen with it eventually. But I spend a lot more time on the road than I did before COVID. Fortunately, it's fun. Less time to fix stuff. It's a long-term project. You attended the Diamond Jubilee. Did you drive the Discovery? I did drive it. Granted, not a huge feat because it was only a couple hours from my house in New Jersey. With all that happened, I don't recall seeing you, so I apologize for if we if we passed. <laughs> we, we did meet up, but I have the same thing. It's like it, the whole thing was a fog. It was like this wonderful moment celebrating Land Rovers and North America. I'm just starting to come down off the high, and it's been, what, like a week now? I know. I remember the countdown to getting yeah. there like it's this is this is two months out this is a month out this week out to 10 days and now i'm like wait a minute it was a week ago what right. happened <laughs> <laughs> it was it was like a fog we had a thousand people there yeah. celebrating land rovers it yes. was just a beautiful thing it was it was it was a wonderful moment that i as i've said before i don't think will be repeated ever the, that number no. of trucks the number of people the type of trucks i don't think you'll ever yeah. see that repeated but it's incredible we had Apparently, as many new defenders as series trucks. It's just really cool to see people coming from all aspects of this hobby. Indeed. Absolutely. So I'm glad you had a good time. At yeah. the, do you have a standout moment from the Diamond Jubilee? I, I got to say, I did a Barbara Choi tribute run, which is something that Scar invented in Texas Rovers. Back in 2015, we did a version of it, and I'm a photographer, and I got to shoot the event with Nick Dimbleby. I've always admired his work. He's just a really cool person, actually, in real life. He is. And I was that taking pictures of Land Rover standing next to Nick Dimbleby and working with him was one of the coolest things I did that weekend. I think I do recall you now taking pictures. Yeah. I saw that get underway. And yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was really cool of activity. Yeah, I saw that as I was getting dragged past it by my dog. <laughs> <laughs> For Greg, factual correction, he said that there was about as many new defenders as there were series. If I go look at the registration information here, there were mm -hmm. over three times as many series as there were new defenders. Were three was a NAS 90, a D2, and a Len had her yeah. marked. Oh. I was just commenting on the new defender. There were that many. There were not that many new defenders there. There was a good showing though. Of there new were defenders. quite a few. But was, there was, I'm not saying it wasn't. Yeah, but it wasn't I'm, one for one. It wasn't and, a one and for one. Zero yeah. freelanders. You yeah. think well, that's. That's one, a later discussion. One, one, yeah, yeah. one, uh, for the record, one registered and apparently it did not show. So there was no. Because the transmission went or the engine went. It did not, of course, make it. We, we don't know why. We have no evidence. We have no, he, no he, communication. So Jeff, Jeff said the guy took a, brought his D90 or something else. He came, but in a different vehicle. Opportunity presented to show up in a real Rover. Okay. He would have been a hero. Greg, the In Search of Sheba, written by Barbara Toy, is being reprinted, and it is a Herculean effort that you have done. Yes. You and Ashley. Jamie. Ashley was not, she's traveling and couldn't join us today to talk yeah. about it, but you guys have done a great thing in order to get Barbara Toy's book reprinted. Hopefully, this will get other, her other books to get reprinted, too, because I'd, I'd love to check those out and read those, and I wasn't spending a couple hundred bucks. I'm sorry, Barbara. I <laughs> spent a couple hundred bucks to get a, a used copy. Remind everybody where they can get the book and a little bit about it, what it's about. And uh... yeah, Barbara Toys in search of Sheba, the story of her 1959 trip to Ethiopia in a series two has been republished by John Murray Press in the United Kingdom and will be available on the 20th of July of this year from 
British booksellers, many of whom will ship to you for cheap or free to North America. Just for clarity, is there a reason we couldn't get available here in North America? I guess it has to do with some sort of copyright issues, I assume. Basically, just the publisher that is republishing it that created the opportunity is not here. They're part of Hachette okay. Book Group, which is one of the big five publishers in the U.S. I don't think that they have a U.S. representation of this. An imprint is like a part of a publishing house, and I don't think there's a U.S. representation for this imprint. Or maybe they don't realize there's a market here. There's yeah, like, I think you know. their rights are sold separately and yeah. stuff. You can get easily from overseas shipped over here. So that's all that matters. Greg, thanks very much for what you've done for the Rover community to get Barber Toys books back in reprint so people can read them. And thank you for joining us on the podcast today from your Discovery 3. Great to be with John and Dixon and Harold. I'm looking forward to everyone getting to finally read this story. Thanks very much for having me and hope to talk soon. We hope you enjoyed show number 123, 123 for June of 2023. Thanks to Nancy McKegg and Greg Fitzgerald for coming on the program this month. Be sure to purchase Barbara Toy's book and support the reprinting of her books. Hopefully this will start the reprinting of all of her books so that we all can enjoy and read those books. And also thanks to Harold, Morgan, Dixon. Thanks again, as always, guys. It was great to see you at Greek Peak, and we can all continue to be here on the podcast. And still get along. Imagine that. There was a concern? Wait, what? Huh? What? Did I miss something? Was there a meeting I missed? We all met up in person, and we didn't kill each other. Ah, fair. Enough. And also thanks to the One True Pax for his continued production support. Pax is expected at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. We're trying to find him a rover to ride in because unfortunately he is roverless at the moment. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. Our website, centersteer.com, has all of our shows, past shows you can listen to, and also show notes with links to the stories we discussed in today's podcast. You can directly support the podcast at patreon.com slash centersteer. You can buy a t-shirt sticker or even buy us a tea slash brown water from the website. If you go to the menu of our webpage, it has the links to all of those. If you have an idea for a guest, send us the details and the contact information if you had it. I did collect a number of contacts for us to get on the program at the Diamond Jubilee. Always looking for more to include in the podcast. In honor of Land Rover's 75th anniversary, you're invited to bring your Land Rover, especially Defender and Series owners, to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, July 22nd and 23rd. You have less than a month to prepare. And please register now if you haven't already for the Vintage Grand Prix. Love to see you there. We really need to have a good showing for this one-off special occasion event and we can get that cool lap of the race course and show them this is the only time Land Rovers are going to get to be on this race course. <laughs> so hopefully you can come out and you can make that. This is going to be a one-time only thing. I'm pretty confident. Unless you count the time when they canceled the race during the pandemic and we drove the course anyway because no one was there to stop us. I've only been to the Vintage Grand Prix twice, but we need that tent. <laughs> yes, I don't want to have to hook up my awning to the side of my Defender and get that big tent. Thank you for listening. We love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. On behalf of the entire crew here at the Center Steer Podcast, I'd like to thank you for listening today. We know you have a choice when it comes to your podcast content, and we do appreciate your choosing us. Please take a moment to look around you for any personal items you may be leaving behind, especially in the overhead bins. Remember that some items may have shifted during the show. Please watch your step on the way out, and you may now resume your important things. It's just every time we walked into that village going across that bridge, I'm just thinking that guy's going to stop us. And he's going to ask us the three questions. What is your name? What is your quest? What is your favorite color? Right then, off you go.